Melody here. You might know me as Apple Pie Movement. I am a humanitarian sharing the conversations with humanity which need to be heard. In today's conversation with my cousin Rand Tucker, we discuss how he has used his platform of being the founding and senior pastor of Hyde Park Vineyard over the last 25 years to create social justice within Chicago. So come on, grab a piece of pie and join our conversation. And if you go back to redlining with real estate or you go back to the building of highways and the neglect of certain communities and the aging of schools and, you know, uh, the breakdown of families. And, and even if you get into the Chicago public housing, you know, it was more favorable to pressure women not to marry because they would get better resources. I mean, it's like the layers of issues um, are, are multi-layered. And, and so, you know, when I talk to people in California, sometimes I talk to old friends and they say like, there's really not racism. Racism's not the issue any longer, but Californians love to kind of think of themselves as not racist until you talk about immigration, right? <laughs> and then all the fireworks come out, right? <laughs> but here in Chicago, immigration is not as large of an issue because it's a sanctuary city and there's immigrants from all over the world. So when it comes to immigration, it's not kind of an us versus them, like south of the border, like you'd have in California. Here you've got people from Poland and Russia, and you've got people who've immigrated, you know, uh, Jewish after World War II. You've got... Uh, you know, the great immigration from the South when African Americans were fleeing the terror, um, you know, throughout the early uh, 20th century. I mean, it's just like, so it's a city of immigrants, but when you get into some of the neighborhoods that are 99 or 100% African American and there's a lot of violence that's going on there, you know, Part of the issues have to do with class and poverty, um, but those class and poverty issues are there because historically those neighborhoods were, uh, uh, you know, um, impoverished because of racism. But the racism persists today because the type of policing that happens in those neighborhoods and how people are treated and kind of the animosity that's developed at an early age between young African Americans and white police, you know, it's like, it's so intertwined. So it's not just like historically racial tension has created these issues, but it, it persists because of those ongoing issues. It's so multi-layered. And when I say I couldn't go back, I think what happened was early on, what that meant to me is something different than it means to me now. Early on, it was more like, I don't think I could go back into those environments that are predominantly white, where people are blind to their privilege, white privilege, where they're unaware that white supremacy still goes on. I mean, we've even seen like the racism flare up with the recent elections um, in the last four or five years has been, some would say a huge setback, but it, in some ways it's more a revelation of what was still there and always has been there, right? And so um, I felt, you know, when you're aware of things, you're called to be a cultural prophet and you can either feel called to be one who raises awareness among those you grew up in, grew up, those you know, or you might feel more, um, called to be an activist and be on the ground where not where you're here with a savior mentality, but with a partner mentality where you come humbly and you come alongside of people. I mean, I can't tell you just absolutely amazing people I've been around, got to meet. I'm uh, being here. I'm, you know, you brought up Michelle Obama. I mean, just the other day, Bobby Rush, our congressman who's served here, for decades and fought for civil rights and now social uh, justice issues in, in Congress. Like he came by and we were talking and I just was so honored. Um, I was surprised. I didn't know that he was also a pastor uh, and pastor of a charismatic church in the community. Uh, but it was great to connect with him both 
you yeah. know, hear his heart uh, for social justice, but also hear his heart in terms of how he cares for the people he's pastoring. So it's so uh, more how, <laughs> <laughs> um, how can we solve for the inequities that, that exist? I mean, the, the violence that happened over this weekend was it due to racial in, injustices, poverty, or COVID-19 and people being tired of lockdown? Um, what, what happened this weekend? Why was it one of the most violent weekends in, in recent history, in your opinion? Gosh, again, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that because um, violence in Chicago has a long history. And some of it has to do with, like I said, the social issues that have plagued us for the last 150 years. Um, what's happening now is an impact of the breakdown of families. Kids are going up without adequate support in their homes. Uh, it's a breakdown of education. You know, uh, education is available to people, but people don't feel safe. Uh, it's, it's not the same experience for people in lower income communities. Um, there are some that are able to like get through because they have adequate support at home, even though it's incredibly difficult in the school systems. And then there's pressure from, you know, others in the community to join gangs. Um, you know, some of the policing in the recent years uh, has also impacted a rise in violence. You know, in the early 90s, we had 600 fatal homicides from gun violence, you know, and then it started to decline to get down to closer to the 300s. But just a couple of years ago, we had 749 people die. 4,100 were shot in a year. I mean, we may By the police a, or gang violence or how, how did this happen? So I, here's my opinion about the r rise of this. I there's a couple of things that happened. One, rightly so, there were a number of uh, fatal shootings from police, from other things that, you know, that were racially charged and those videos were suppressed, at least here in Chicago, and then they were released. And what ended up happening is the police felt pressure, in some ways rightly so, to stop preventative uh, you know, you know, they, they stopped uh, stopping people for kind of associated reasons when they thought there could be probable cause that there was gang related activity or drug selling and things like that. And so basically like eight uh, stops by police went down 85% and they just started responding to calls about crime. I, I talked to an officer about this and Basically, what ends up happening in that situation is you're responding to an act rather than preventing it. But when they were attempting to prevent it, they also were racially profiling. And so they weren't fairly stopping people and policing across the board. And so that led to a rise in violence. Another thing that the police did is that they did a couple of high profile raids on gang leaders. And these were some of the older men in the community. And so there was sort of a code of conduct about how things were happening. And what ended up happening is it ended up fracturing these gangs and it created smaller groups of younger people who were carrying weapons. And so conflict escalated. They also tore down starting in the you know, 90s and early 2000s, like they tore down the housing projects which had become horrendous, the police corruption, drugs, violence, they, become, uh, they became unlivable. But when they uh, displaced people, they made promises about where they would relocate people. But in 2008, when the economy failed, a lot of the plans that they had to address like housing, they failed because they were doing set aside housing where 10 to 20% of new housing was gonna be set aside for low-income families. 
But when development stopped, it freezed everybody. So what ended up happening is it, it made poor neighborhoods worse off. It pushed rivals closer together and it took away any kind of senior leadership among these neighborhoods and gangs away and left smaller fractured groups of people. And so it ended up creating a situation where in the past, local leaders uh, were able to meet with gang leaders, talk about a truce, work through issues, and that would impact large communities of people. Thanks for joining another Apple Pie Table Talk, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye, Melody. <laughs> Bye, Rand. Thank you.